Well, um, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm so grateful uh, for the invitation and for this um, opportunity to uh, sit with and talk with uh, and see in person um, to people whom I consider uh, kindred spirits and um, perhaps uh, mem uh, some of the others of you uh, who've come out of your way this evening um, to, to be w with us uh, may indeed well be kindred spirits. Uh, and I feel that very much uh, sense of community, sense of uh, intellectual community and, and uh, sympathy. I also feel that uh, it's a privilege to be with the three out of the four people who've actually read my book um, are in this room, one of them being me, the other one being my spouse who could not be here this evening. So um, um, my mother died before she got through it, so she, she doesn't really count. Uh, but anyway, no, it, it, you, you can't believe how gratifying it is to... Uh, to really be on the same wavelength enough to, to share a, a vocabulary um, and, and to use a concept. Um, I feel very much after seeing the exhibition for the first time this evening, other than in book form um, and checklist form, I, I feel uh, that, that you've brought Celia, a, a, a dimension um, to to the the notion of eccentricity uh, in conjunction with modernism that I could never have imagined, and I also feel very indebted and have said the same to Nick um, about the the incredible impact uh, of. Um, his artistic projects, and this is a conversation that I, I just feel very, very privileged to, um, to, to partake in. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I discovered a, just a sort of personal narrative about my relationship with Christian Berhar, and um, you'll forgive me for relying uh, heavily on a text, um, but if you knew me better, you'd know that it's a very good idea for me to have a script because um, I do digress. So uh, let me just begin by telling you a little bit about my first encounter with Christian Berhard, known to his friends as Bebe. Um, he claimed my attention in the course of research for an exhibition about Gertrude Stein uh, that Benjamin uh, referenced called Gertrude Stein, uh, Seeing Gertrude Stein, Five Stories. And I curated that about 10 years ago at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco and the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. with the art historian Wanda Korn. And you see her here with me um, posing uh, theatrically against Gertrude Stein's wallpaper. Um, we organized the exhibition and its companion book into freestanding stories revolving around thematic clusters of images. We're not either of us literary scholars, although we worked closely with and were advised by people who actually knew something about Stein's writing. Um, we were looking at the visual stories, the visual stories in particular um, around her life and around her, her, her choices um, and the way that she represented herself through uh, visual, um, using visual means, um, the way she set herself. And uh, so the images that we selected formed constellations that illuminated different aspects of her life and different aspects of her creative life. Um, and we divided the research up for the exhibition according to our own um, predilections as uh, art historians. And one of my research areas was dogs. Um, and um, here you see two really outstanding and little known pho photographs by Man Ray. 
uh, one of Gertrude Stein and her dog, Basket, and the other of Basket modeling a jacket made for him by Alice Toklas. The other, um, uh, uh, another of my research areas was collaborations, and another was friendships, and those, of course, overlapped. Under the headings of friendships and collaborations, um, we, of course, included the fabled aspects of Gertrude Stein's history, her lifelong partnership with Alice B. Toklas, her um, rivalry and friendship with Ernest Hemingway, her bond with Pablo Picasso, but we also introduced a story that had, uh, that was not as familiar to most people, the story of what Stein referred to as her second family. Um, one of the members of the second family, and this is by no means a comprehensive grid, but um, uh, several, several of her uh, acolytes uh, and, uh, and family members are represented here, including Behar, uh, very young and beardless, in the top row, uh, second from the right. The intentional family um, extended beyond Stein's partnership with Alice B. Toklas to include a cohort of young gay men most aspiring to careers in the arts, and I began to think of them as eccentric modernists. My book, Eccentric Modernisms, grew out of this Gertrude Stein exhibition, and um, the cover of the book uh, points back to the exhibition. You can see the relationship between the book cover and one of the artifacts we featured in our Stein exhibition. This is the souvenir program for the opera Four Saints in Three Acts. The opera was produced by Stein and the composer Virgil Thompson, a key member of Stein's second family. The book Eccentric Modernism presents a range of art historically eccentric ephemera, including this souvenir opera program, that show how Stein's second family um, contributed to the development of the avant-garde uh, in uh, uh, the United States across the Atlantic. In this spread from the opera program, you see a visual portrait of Stein by Behar on the left, and on the right, a musical portrait of Stein by Virgil Thompson. And this was the extent of Behar's participation in the opera uh, endeavor. And one chapter of the book Eccentric Modernisms is devoted to the opera Four Saints in Three Acts, and in particular to this souvenir program. Uh, and I won't say any more about it tonight. Another chapter focuses on the artist's book, Dix Portraits, Ten Portraits, a bilingual volume of literary portraits by Gertrude Stein, illustrated by several members of her se second family, Behar, for one, um, and edited by the poet Georges Unier, published in Paris in 1930. The book was a sort of do-it-yourself pantheon a collective self-promotional effort that both, but both boosted and leveraged Stein's reputation before she'd gained widespread recognition while establishing the kinship bonds and avant-garde credentials of the collaborating artists. Um, you see five of them in these portraits, uh, which were part of the uh, De Portrait project on the top left Virgil Thompson by Christian Behar, and on the top right, a self-portrait by Behar. I think it's telling that it's a self-portrait of him making a portrait. And on the, in the lower row, um, there's a portrait of Georges Unier by Eugène Berman, a portrait of Pavel Chelichev in the middle, and a self-portrait of uh, Berman. These visual portraits were 
were accompanied by Stein's literary portraits representing the same sitters. The Deep Portrait project brought together a cosmopolitan core of young gay men who supported one another's careers in the years that followed. Their self-assurance as artists and avowed homosexuals and their tight friendships grew stronger under the mentorship of a woman who um, manifestly lived and created art by her own rules. As the world economic crisis worsened along with Europe's political tensions in the 1930s, many members of Stein's second family migrated from Paris to the other side of the Atlantic where the artists represented in D. Portrait participated in and contested modernist trends as they evolved in the US. The opera Four Saints in Three Acts was one such path-breaking event as New York critics only grudgingly acknowledged. Virgil Thompson originally proposed Behar um, as the set and costume designer for this opera, but Stein had gone sour on Behar, something about him taking too long to deliver a promised portrait, which was a pattern with him, um, and she, uh, she rejected Thompson's recommendation. Stein's rejection of Behar as unreliable followed later by Thompson's expressed disappointment in what he saw as Behar's lack of ambition and unfulfilled artistic promise made me all the more curious about Behar and all the more interested in what both his friends and critics considered eccentric career investments and artistic choices. Um, so, Nick and I thought it might be useful within the context of the current exhibition um, to elaborate um, each of us in our own way on the notion of eccentricity referenced in the show's title. Christian Behar, eccentric bébé. Uh, eccentricity, the quality of deviating from the norm and not being situated in the center, describes both subjects like Behar and also the unorthodox research methodologies that have served Nick and Celia and myself, as each of us has engaged with Behar's oeuvre and his legacy. Eccentric po points toward practices that do not fit conventional art historical templates. Um, and as you, you said um, in one of our conversations, that it's so uh, incredible that Behar was really at the center of so many things, um, and, and, and yet uh, it, it has become so little vi visible and so per perif so marginalized um, in, in um, the historical discourse about the modern, modernist period. And that um, can be explained uh, in a lot of different ways. And one of them is um, this sort of habit of, um, of the monograph uh, and, um, and the focus of traditional narratives of modern art um, centering on singular artists and singular artworks. So embracing this notion of eccentricity um, enables us to deviate from the norm and reframe modernism as a set of passionate social as well as aesthetic transactions among collaborators across the artistic spectrum. It's significant that the word eccentric and the word queer have been used historically more or less interchangeably. Queer and eccentric both point to departures from social and cultural orthodoxies. And although I privileged the term eccentric in my study of Behar and his modernist cohort, 
queer and queerness relate intimately to the notion of eccentric modernisms as I understand it. The artists celebrated in the exhibition here, historically characterized as comprising a milieu rather than a movement, banded together for avowedly social, and by that I also mean sexual, as well as artistic purposes. Boris Lipnitsky's 1947 photograph of Behar on the set for Les Bonnes by Jean Genet um, materializes and pays tribute to this rich rela relational and disciplinary nexus. Perceived an eccentricity entwined with artistic vocation afforded the members of this milieu a degree of behavioral leeway with respect to prevailing social codes. While conventional art histories and art historical exhibitions spotlight unique works of art, paintings and sculptures mostly, by singular artistic geniuses, the exhibition Christian Berard Eccentrique Bebe prominently includes works of interior and theatrical decor, commercial graphics, sketches, drafts, and photographs that help us see the modernist period, the modernist project, and even canonical artistic genres such as portraiture quite differently. In carefully calculated ways, the material practices and exchanges of eccentric modernists, and Berhard in particular, cemented queer alliances across the arts across generations, across continents and oceans. In 2022, Nick created this montage of Behar's page costume of 1933 and Lipnitsky's photographic portrait of Behar from 1938. Portraiture was, and as you can see, continues to be one of the primary devices for making and marking affinities and alliances. The exhibition, um, Eccentrique Bebe, focuses on Behar, but it implicates his larger family of artists, poets, performers, patrons, and designers to cultivate uh, deeper understandings of modernism and, and part of that syntax um, throughout the exhibition uh, uh, is, portr is portraiture. Berhard and the members of his circle by working collaboratively in such arenas as opera, ballet, interior de decor, fashion and theater made no claims about modern arts autonomy its absolute independence from social, the social context of its production. Pache Clement Greenberg. Um, but they openly explored art's implication in modern social and sexual relations. Rather than espousing notions of medium-specific purity, eccentric modernists privileged interdisciplinary and hybrid genres, and at, the at a time of heightened nationalism, including the re in the rhetoric of art criticism, they devoted much of their creative energy to sustaining affiliations across territorial and cultural boundaries. Their artistic alliances formed, and we sense this strongly um, in the exhibition, around a common resistance to social norms, and strong affection for one another. Friendship, passion, intentional kinship invest the objects we see here with their peculiar poignancy as well as their aesthetic vitality. Thank you. Thank you <clears throat> so much. Um, I, um, yeah, I'm also really thrilled to be able to talk alongside and after I give a short presentation with you because I feel like, um, I mean, this is only the second time we're meeting in person, but you've been very much on my mind through your, your work. And um, 
anyway, I thought I would tell the story as well of how I encountered Berard, um, because um, we both thought it might be helpful to um, show how two different people with different methods of approaching this artist um, you know, followed that impetus and where it led us. Um, then I'll go on to talk about a single work that, um, or the making of a single work dedicated to him, which uh, makes an appearance in this exhibition. But as Celia said, it's uh, um, its second cameo appearance in Monaco. And so it kind of brackets this long collaboration, um, with this like, you know, fantastic collaboration with Celia and the entire team of the NMNM. Um, let me see if I can get in here. Hmm. Where did it go? Thank you. I think also what I want to try and do in a kind of abstract way, thinking about um, what Tirza calls the unorthodox research practices is describe in a way how, uh, so through my entry point into Berard, how he sort of triggered my own unorthodox research practices. Though I always have a hard time with the word research. Um, and maybe we can talk about that later. Um, so a little over 10 years ago, I went from having never heard of Christian Berard um, and certainly never having seen his work, to finding his name and traces seemingly everywhere. Um, you know, I can say that and it doesn't sound like much of a revelation, but for me, this shift uh, permanently changed the way that I see and what I look for, what I gloss over, the way I study uh, the apparently seamless fabric of art history for dropped stitches. As an artist, I'd been seeking um, a way of relating to other artists, both living and not living, that was not linear and not hierarchical. Um, I, you know, alongside my studies, I was also studying art history, and I was missing, or I felt like there must be more complexity, contradiction, intimacy. I mean, you just mentioned the word affection. Um, you know, I, I just had a sense like there, there's something that's not being transmitted or told, um, and there must be a way to find that. And so I began going to the library um, to flip through uh, old American art magazines um, because I wanted to get away from this omniscient narrative, closer to the the kind of language that artists used, the way they announced their exhibitions, the way they addressed one another. Um, I was interested in how the work was received, um, how it was framed. And um, I arrived at some of the same material that, that Tirza reads so closely in um, her incredibly valuable book, Eccentric Modernisms, Making Differences in the History of American Art, which really um, continues to be a revelation <laughs> and was such an inspiration for the show. Um, so looking through these magazines and, and getting a bit closer to what I was looking for, I was really shocked to find that there was so much proof of these other worlds of art that were much more interesting, rambunctious, witty, queer, um, than the neutralized canonical modernism that I had been instructed to accept as the backdrop for my own work. Um, and so in the process of this search, which wasn't really a search for antecedents, but just for something that could reorient me, um, Berard appeared as um, a missing link between a lot of people who are much more familiar. Um, and it was strange to suddenly see him so vividly in the way that you see him in this exhibition in the company of Gertrude Stein, Virgil Thompson, Elsa Schiaparelli, Jean Cocteau, etc. This is actually um, uh, a dedication page from a uh, volume of poems by Charles Henri Ford published in the 70s. So it's, you see Berard's name uh, come up in a completely different personalized context. Um, 
but yeah, it was it was strange for me to suddenly see this person come into focus who literally hadn't existed to me existed for me before, who I'd never heard of, nobody had ever talked about, and um, I intuited why this kind of artist, an artist like Berard, would be written out of the canon, um, and th that kind of drove me to go even more directly towards him, and I tried to find as much information as I could, which was hard to do in, in New York at the time. Um, but I want to say that my interest was not to recuperate him. Um, that's not what this narrative is. Um, it, was, it was sort of two things, I think. One is that I, I became completely enamored of the work. Um, you know, these ink drawings smudged by the passage of a sleeve or by self-doubt. Um, the self-portraits with, with tears in their eyes, the, the rugs, interiors, the fashion spreads, the fashion magazine covers, the stage designs. Um, but then at the same time, it wasn't Berard as an individual artist who interested me so much um, as Berard as a kind of connector and a collaborator, instigator, um, who really set or through his work created this example um, for me, of all these other forms of creative agency that can't necessarily be measured in finished permanent works of art, but they transpire between people in real time and um, have a different but no less important resonance. So, well, a little too soon, but in finding Berard and with him um, a kind of sense of permission um, through the vast net he cast in his varied but interrelated activities and complicities, I also found someone who was kind of unraveling categories um, and value judgments. And I thought about how I could address this intrusion into my life, um, how to incorporate this unraveling without, you know, without using Berard as a, as a kind of figure who would be instrumentalized didactically, um, or without resorting to the gesture of homage, because paying homage to Berard would mean pretending that he was available as a figure to be indebted to in the first place, and he didn't exist. Um, so it's Berard's former ubiquity, like you pointed out, the fact that he was so central at one point, and his present absence that came to stand uh, for me for a larger historical condition that I wanted to reflect as part of the process of my own making and thinking. Um, this sense of working consistently with blind spots, elisions, and cover-ups. And so I, I visited, that's this picture here, the antechamber in the Institut Guerlain um, that Berard had designed at Jean-Michel Franck's behest in 1935. Um, which is so graphically stunning, um, extravagant materially, and um, you know, absolutely irreverent in collapsing styles, speeds, and epics. And um, I felt that Berard, that sort of the totality of his work in painting, fashion illustration, book illustration, decors, and costumes for theater, was synthesized in this space, um, which is not. You know, it's, it's not so much a space as it's an interval, a memory, um, a moment of connection, a passage between one interior and another. Um, though, of course, it also alludes to the four walls of the theater, which we uh, uphold via suspension of disbelief. Um, and it compartmentalizes three versions of reality, the reality of the audience, the reality of the stage, and the reality of the actors and the technicians backstage. So I used my own body to, me to measure out the space and um, set out to remake it as best as I could, sort of from, from memory and with these notes, working with uh, an incredible seamstress um, who had worked for theater and television and really understood what, what this undertaking was about. Um, and once we realized this room, the passageway became a kind of feature of my work that allowed me to do things that I hadn't done before. Um, mm -hmm. It was this presence that was never quite explained, um, but perhaps also didn't have to be. Um, 
these are some details of the original antechamber um, in the Institut Guerlain. And as you can see, it's you know almost like these Roy Lichtenstein brush strokes, but they're made of cut ribbons sewn onto the velvet backing. Um, I've installed the antechamber in different configurations, um, but always as a condition or a framing device, um, a filter for my own work um, and uh, the, the work of making transhistorical configurations, uh, constellations of works by other artists. And um, in several instances, it's become a pretext for showing aspects of an institution's collection in a new way. Um, this is the, the first time I showed it in Minneapolis, where um, essentially there it was an exhibition of my drawings with this room dropped in the, into the middle of it. As a conflation of subjectivity with inner space, the room can be something like a character, um, a personification, or a portrait in and of itself. Um, you know, the more I looked at this this object space, I became really interested in how it, you know, kind of translates back and forth. It's a drawing. That's a room. Um, it's painting made with the techniques of couture. Um, it's uh, it's a room, but it's a stage. Uh, it's it's a room that's an event. I mean, it just kind of keeps generating things um, and kind of new ideas and and uh, definitions of itself. So I'm just going through a few different. This was the the first time it was shown um, here in Monaco in Portrait d'Intérieur um, with. Uh, works that I had made and works um, from, from the collection. Uh, you see a small Chelichev gouache hanging on the velvet wall, a preparatory study for the ballet ode. Um, if I'm honest, uh, the current installation upstairs uh, within the Berard survey is the one that I've been most anxious about because um, it blends in really well. Um, you know, it's... it's uh, all these other versions that I showed you kind of stood in contrast with surrounding artworks, um, with the kind of standardized spaces uh, in which we're used to confronting contemporary art. Of, but this journey of this room that kind of keeps reappearing and, and again, allowing me to do different things um, continues here also. Uh, you know, once we installed the work, I, I, I learned something new about it as well. Um, where did I find the license to insinuate Berard into my work? Um, as soon as I saw this room, I, I internalized it as part of a subconscious architecture that allowed me to think of other continuities and, and passages. And um, so what I've tried to describe is that I wanted to make my, you know, my thinking in a way almost like this backstage of thinking visible as part of... Uh, of my work, um, but also felt for the viewer. You know, there's something about walking into this room and realizing that it's made of velvet, it's incredibly tactile and sensuous, that kind of brings in so much other information. Um, Berard himself used the work of other artists as a catalyst or as an acknowledged and kind of embedded inspiration, um, such as the incredible album he made of photographs of the Contest de Castiglione. Um, of which I have an image here, where he, I don't know where he got them, but he had a stack of these images and glued them into an album and then invented a story around it. Um, so that almost in and of itself was shocking for me that he would sort of resort to this, um, this incredibly uh, sort of radical, private artistic practice and absorb it into his own and make something, something further with it. Um, another thing that, that was very much on my mind is a statement by Louise Lawler who stated that art is always a collaboration with what came before and what comes after you. No work is really produced alone. So um, the Velvet Room in the end is kind of like the elaboration of this very simple gesture 
um, the gesture of opening a door. Um, and uh, it relies on whatever capacities the viewer brings to it. Um, it's a space of projection and fantasy. It's a social space of sort of the past and the future. Um, it's, I mean, one thing I could say about how I worked with it is I decided to install it backwards from the way it is in the Institut Guerlain so that it doesn't disclose itself immediately as this kind of open um, uh, image. Um, but you kind of have to discover it as you open the door and you enter into it. And it plays with the sense of curiosity and expectation and also not knowing. Um, and then the question is kind of, you know, what is the space that the viewer enters into? Um, or, or, or what are they emerging from? Um, so that too is, is the space defined by the work. I think it's this very thin, heightened threshold. Um, that marks the border between um, one mental space and another, um, between notions of inside and outside, um, between the stage and the backstage that I keep referring to, almost like the, the stage and the backstage of art history. Um, and I think importantly also it has to do on an emotional level for me about you know, transitioning from our styles of behavior to the way we might imagine ourselves to be. Um, so, that's the end. Um, maybe now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, just building on what you were saying about the room and that space that's, um, you mean, thinking about that in, 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 in light of the uh, statement by Louise Lawler that art is a collaboration about uh, it's cre created out of what came before it and what what comes after it, and that and that seems to be um, to imply a sort of the the, the artist in the present um, and the act in the present as a sort of transitional s space, mm. like an antechamber. It's not really nothing is ever fixed. It isn't a space that um, uh, that has any other function other than to kind of um, uh, uh, transition from one uh, from the past in, into the future. Um, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, 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 so I'm interested in your. Uh, identification with uh, with that space as an as an artist, um, and I, I know I mean I made a, a kind of uh, a Freudian slip the other day when I was talking about your book um, transmissions and um, I I said transitions and um, I, and and now I I can't really remember which one is the real title right, right. so i don't know help me um y y with with that with that your your work um is one of connecting um and you talked about berhar mm. in in a similar way as as a kind of bridging figure mm. and your bridge is um not only contemporaneous but but a kind of temporal uh uh you're having a conversation with with um, uh, 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 your your ancestors, um, perhaps, or your um, people that you 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 recognize even in their absence, um, who who uh, kind of c converge in in your in your practice, and then um, what you give. Um, the, tra the, the transmission, mm. um, um, part of that uh, transitional space that what you what your work opens into mm. um, changes. I mean that that space opens onto different things at, in different places at different times. And sometimes there are your things that you made, and sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of it's it's very. Um, uh, versatile, that metaphor in in your practice, and I'm wondering, will you see it 
Uh, will you see this actual piece uh, moving anywhere else? Or um, are, are, has it just become a part of of something that you've learned in the way, uh, in, in the way of how you how you make art. That's a great question. I think um, uh, this piece that I spoke about has a, a, a place for me just because I um, uh, it, um, it became a kind of apparatus, like a sort of self-invented apparatus that you know helped me think about, oh, how do I move from drawing to architecture? That was something that I was really concerned with at the time. How do I bring in the body and gesture and, um, and then sort of open the frame and also acknowledge, you know, all the peripheral things that go into the making of a work but are often not seen or they're just kind of, you know, ingested and you know, invisible. Um, so it, it was this kind of dual movement on the one hand of, of kind of finding a figure who, um, you know, once he became visible, mm -hmm. completely changed how I understood the, the connections that I had taken for granted in a certain way. They reconnected in new ways. But, it's, but it was also, you know, how do I not make this a work that's um, only about that, but it can also, you know, it can be open to people who have no knowledge of, as I did, or no interest in Berar, and just have, you know, something else happen to them. And what, what is the sort of what goes on in that space? I, that's that's something that I'm I'm very interested in. And when I was talking about this kind of historical condition that I that I find myself in, I think it really is that the sort of impossibility of measuring. Um, you know, there's a affective response that draws me to, to an artist like this, but then there's also so much that can't, um, um, can't be reconstructed and, and wouldn't translate today anyway. So how to, how to move forward. Um, uh, and things that, that are meant to be, to, 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 to perish really. Mm -hmm. I mean, things that are only, the, 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 the kind of commitment to ephemerality that um, the, well, we see um, the residual evidence of a lot of work uh, that wasn't really meant to be um, exhibited uh, here in, in, the, in the exhibition, but also, unfortunately, um, we get to look at it. It wasn't dis destroyed, except for that story about the costumes. You know, that's just so great, because that kind of does sum it up. I mean, theater... Um, ephemerality and 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 theater. Um, uh, it, it, these are su such powerful moments, um, and bringing together so much energy and so so many different skill sets, and then they're over. And you do yes have uh, performance photography to attenuate um, the. The, the experience um, because the photographs in, in the, if for people who've seen the performance, they're, they're props and they can trigger a kind of mental recreation of you know, the experience. And for people who haven't seen the performance, um, they don't really do that work. Um, they document. Uh, but but they can't, you know. I, I'm, I, I love them, but they, I'm glad that some, some performance photography exists, but unless the, the photographer is also kind of making a move um, to transmit something of the performance that's happening in front of the camera that's alluding to a performance, like, Maybe the Russian ballet, uh, the you know Adolf de Meyer and um, his photographs of of, of uh, uh, Nijinsky or something. That, that that there's a there's another performance that that happens every time you look at one of those photographs. Doesn't have anything to do with what happened on stage, but but it has a life of its own. And I feel some of the. Um, the juxtaposition in this exhibition of photographs that, that, that sort of still a moment that has passed and photographs that, that create a new moment 
um, by their visual impact in some other time frame. Uh, I think I think that's really um, uh, uh, kind of evocative of um, the 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 career uh, uh, pitfalls, I guess, of, mm. of, of, of people who, 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 for whom the stage um, uh, is, is the space of, of creation. Um, and, and I think ephemerality, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, um, I love how much of that uh, comes back into a sort of tactile um, and, and temporal uh, uh, contemporary reality in, in this show and, and in, in the catalog. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's definitely working against the grain to rely on ephemera as heavily as I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering in your, in your work too, I know that you're very attracted to archival mm -hmm. um, Sort of, you know, sleuthing and mm. um, shuffling through folders of old papers, and um, you know, finding all this weird stuff, mm. and then, and then, and then, you, you know, the advantage you have, I, I think, um, or the skill that you have, is to kind of make something else happen mm. out of it, like those people who photographed Nijinsky. Mm. Um, it, you make something happen that's present, that's mm. presently relevant, uh, and and yet there's still uh, that um, sort of mysterious um, overinvestment in something that was meant to perish mm. um, is, uh, uh, as I, I use the word poignancy, it, it, it comes to mind again that perishability <laughs> of the material of um, 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 the material that bears witness to something that happened that isn't widely acknowledged as having happened. Right. Um, and ephemerality for queer people is a thing. Well, I wanted and to I, ask you I don't about know, that. You know, I'm not quite. I mean, I'd love to hear what you think about um, why that why that language of ephemera is 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 um, so um, accessible or respected um, by by um, uh, I think queer artists mm -hmm. and um, um, I don't know how many queer art historians would say the same thing, but probably quite a few. And um, I think that as a as a sort of curatorial investment, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's um, really still uh, not um, that common, you know? And, and you can tell kind of the way art handlers treat um, <laughs> some of the ephemera that, you know, uh, we use in exhibitions with a little less respect than maybe some other kinds of objects. Mm. Um, and it, it, it just, the, the valuation um, of the object and the way that you, you put it into a space that places value on it. Um, I think you do that in your practice. Well, I, th I think um, I developed or I learned a lot about it working with Celia um, on previous exhibitions where um, it became possible to well, or the challenge was, okay, let's, you know, an exhibition about Leon Baxt, how are you going to do that? How will you communicate these ephemeral, time-based, collaborative artworks to um, people using whatever <laughs> scraps are still available? And then we would go and touch these things and understand how they were constructed and try to, without um, ever pretending that it would be possible to, mm -hmm. to completely... Um, reanimate any of these things to at least establish sort of the context and, and a really informed context, but then also do something um, sort of sensual and surprising. And um, uh, I think, you know, going into archives and, and handling that material is very, you know, it, 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 these are things that, that move from one hand to another. They're very 
you know, I think instantly you can get kind of overwhelmed by how intense that is in a way that artworks don't. You know, I, maybe because we sort of mentally remove them or put mm. them on a pedestal. You don't get to touch them that often. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but um, maybe it comes from personal practice. You know, writing letters or something. Mm. You kind of immediately understand what what you're confronting. Um, but you you have said something about um, sort of writing or constructing queer art history and um, making it up, or sort of the need to make it up. And I. I I've found um, a lot of times, you know, when you're working uh, around gaps and so on, you do have to make it up. And, mm -hmm. and there is this kind of, um, you know, uh, it's actually a great possibility. You can do so much with that um, uh, in playing both with sort of with what's not there and then what you decide to introduce. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you, how you find the sort of the making up operating well I have work. something that I have to police um, because you know I let it get away with, with me sometimes without I need other people to read my work and say well, how do you know that you know where did you find that oh well, good good question uh, but so I've, I've tried to internalize that sort of you know skeptic um, and the footnote uh, you know ins insistent footnote um, writer, um, but but yeah, making it up. I mean, the the sometimes the gaps are just more eloquent too than mm. than whatever could be said. I mean, when um, looking at the Beinecke uh, to uh, the letters of the poet American poet H. D. to her lover Breyer, um, which were expurgated by H. D.'s daughter, I mean, literally incised, you know, writing was cut out of the page. Um, and I said, like, not, you know, nothing that she could have said would be more powerful than this, like, hole in the page um, at the end of that sentence. So I, I, I feel like sometimes just respecting the gap or calling attention to the gap mm. um, makes up uh, m makes up enough. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you know uh, that that's that's one thing. But the other thing is I I, I do have uh, I do rely a lot on the in, the intuitions about silences and absences that um, we've come to think of actually um, as a gaydar. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I feel very confident that, that, that there's something there and that my job is to kind of find out what, what it is or at least find out why I can't find out what it is. Right, right. Um, and that'll do. Yeah, I, th I think for me it's sort of the why, why I can't find, or why didn't I know this? Why can't I find, you know, why is it covered up? That was the a kind of, I mean, I think there was a lot of anger there mm -hmm. motivating me for a mm -hmm. long time. And, um, well, mine was just, I was just desperate, mm -hmm. you know. I, I, I don't know, I, now I'm angry, mm -hmm. but in the beginning I was just desperate uh, yeah. to find the, the stories that um, seemed to include me in some way or yeah. um, uh, my people, mm -hmm. uh, you know. But you've also, you, um, I mean, in, in eccentric modernisms, there's a lot about reading that material as, uh, you know, it's intended uh, as much for the people who were there for those events as it is for the future, which I find um, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe a lot of this archival work also, yeah. that there's, you know, people are leaving traces on purpose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for right. some other... exactly, that it only has meaning later mm -hmm. in, in, or in there so many uh, I mean in so many ways so many of the people whose work in of the past um, continues to resonate today um, had that awareness I think that the fullness of the meaning of what they were doing was not even quite evident to them but um, um, if it was, you know, uh, uh, possibly part of, of, of creating um, uh, a culture um, 
in which the work would be legible. And, and, th and that's, you know, I'm going to talk about a, a collective project. I mean, that's sort of putting faith in the, the conversation that you can't ever know um, uh, how it turned out um, or with whom uh, or why. Uh, so, so there's something of a paying forward or something. There's something of a gesture of, of, of giving without strings attached mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in the act of, I think, a lot of the way we, we work um, with in, in the cultural arena from whatever, you know, with whatever skill set we have is, is um, carrying forward I, I, uh, some ideas and some conversations and some um, ways of, of, of kind of modeling um, uh, uh, making making work um, that's uh, you know ha ha has an ethical dimension and mm -hmm. has an aesthetic dimension, um, but we can't. I mean, the life of the life of the work is beyond our. The life of the work we do is. It, I mean, if it if it has a life, and we're lucky if it does, then it then it's you know it, it it's free of us. Um, um, quite early on, uh, really, uh, I think it's it's uh, it's 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 given um, to uh, to something much beyond you know our own mm. our own egos or you right. know uh, careers. Yeah. So I I I. I uh, I feel like the flags on the top of the building here, you know, um, waving in the night air out there uh, and inviting um, and waving goodbye um, and, 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 and just being part of the sky and part of the skyline. I think that metaphorically is also not dissimilar to your antechamber. Mm. Um, this sort of act of, of uh, uh, you create something and then you put it out there and mm -hmm. it, it flies, mm -hmm. uh, you know? That's so nice. <laughs> but there are, pro I, I, uh, there are probably other people who want to say um, well, kind I, things about your work. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> so I, I, can, I wanted to I ask you stop. one specific yeah. question yeah. that actually today I was really thinking. Oh, I, I've never asked tears of this. Um, and it's, it's something I'm working through personally, um, the use of the term um, queer modernism. I, at a certain point, I started thinking, well, all modernism is queer. Yeah. So how, how I, I mean, I guess the mission is to sort of I, turn that sweatshirt inside out so that that becomes obvious, but um, how I try not to use the term anymore because I want to insist. Well, I don't know. I just don't know how to how to how to how to work with it. Um, and I wonder what what you feel about that. Do you know what I mean? Like in a way, I, I worry that if I use the term queer modernism, I'm kind of it's it's the sidecar. You haven't told but me. it's the car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. And that is exactly the dilemma. You know, I, I, I completely know what you mean. Um, and, 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 and what I, that was, that explains, I think, for me, why um, I used eccentric mm -hmm. instead of queer mm -hmm. for uh, the book project, um, even though I really meant queer. Um, but... Um, eccentric seemed to me to be because 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 it has centric in it. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to be doing the things that you know. It seemed to be both sides of this sweatshirt. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to be uh, central and and not and um, and queer. Um, I know it was meant to do that job of being um, capacious and open. Um, and it just failed. Mm 
I, I, I'm very fond of the word queer and use it a lot, um, but um, I've, I, I, it shuts down around gay. Mm -hmm. um, it, it reduces to gay, and um, it's just not. So instead of having to explain that every right. time I turned around, I thought oh, another word would probably do a better job um, of being um, what, what, what is meant by queer, that off, that off center, that um, off kilter, that uh, uh, peripheral thing that defines what's central, that, no, all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so now it's eccentric. Yeah. But it's definitely queer adjacent. No, I, I mean, I, I, I read it and I immediately understood that. And then I, I, you know, I thought, okay, what is this going to do? And, you know, the book is so um, laser sharp and clear in terms of, you know, what these choices enable in thinking and uh, um, remapping, or, you know, um, thinking of different trajectories and temporalities mm -hmm. um, that that are more um, generative, um, and I mean that's what I was in a way trying to narrate is that I sort of kept hitting a wall because I felt like w whatever the narratives were that I was inheriting were quite um, rigid um, and blocked so much from view and mm -hmm. access, um, and uh, yeah, I think. Eccentric does a lot. Thanks. <laughs> I can die happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> I probably will, too. <laughs> but not right now. No. no uh, not, not, on your, not on your shift, right? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I never read one of your book. Uh, but when that, that, you I know. <laughs> when you are meaning queer, you're talking about a way of life. Or do you really um, divide <clears throat> the people be because of their sexuality? No, just exactly why I didn't use the word queer is because I was, I was afraid it would do that. Um, or imply that there was, you know, there were queer people and not queer people when, um, in fact, uh, you know, it's basically just a way of looking at at at, uh, at conventions or seeing, you know, seeing out around the corner of conventions. Oh yeah, no, I, is that, no yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm very mixed, but w w one of the things that surprised me was um, the second family idea, you know, um, just, just, uh, talk about being in the center of the story. I mean, this was not something that she hid. Um, mm -hmm. uh, neither was her, obviously, her relationship with Alice B. Toklas. Um, but but uh, mo you know, when you have to wade through the secondary literature about Gertrude Stein and her career, um, there's a lot of Picasso in it. Um, and there's quite a lot of Hemingway in it. And that, you know, there's nothing about these really, some of these second family folks like Frances Rose, for example, who was very important to her and total, um, like another, another artist who's just off the, uh, the radar. And I have to say, um, possibly deservedly so, um, but 
And also, just it was just an asshole. I mean, she had some friends in her second family who were n not um, people I would uh, ad admire or spend a lot of time um, wanting to get to know. But on the other hand, that's the thing about being queer is you kind of take what you can get. You know, um, it does cut across political affiliations, sometimes class background, um, um, cultural, you know, um, uh, givens in in ways because you know your your you, your community um, is uh, a community of allies, a community of people you can be relaxed. Uh, with about who um, uh, you you are in the fullness of your being and in your desires and in your um, uh, choices of companionship and and so it makes for I and mean, that's that thing strange bedfellows you know it makes for some really strange uh, counterintuitive. Um, uh, uh, well, I guess that word milieu, you know, um, uh, uh, the community formation is transversal. And um, it, it, so the, the second family, the, fa the fact that, that she had this group of mostly younger gay men who adored her and helped build her career um, and build her visibility uh, that was something that that didn't surprise me once I uh, once I learned about it. But what surprised me was that nobody talked about it. Um, and 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 that was yet another one of these things. It was just so there. It was so everywhere um, in in her story. That no, that the, all of her. Uh, uh, Close relationships were definitely not with gay people, but they were of a special character because I think they were they were all really important to each other um, um, as as a, a, a source of um, security and support that um, they weren't confident they would find in um, uh, a lot of other contexts. And so the 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 artist who published that book *De Portrait* is not a gay man, um, and yet I mean I do think that 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 notion of queer adjacency um, uh, is interesting that way because he um, was completely uh, uh, integrated into um, into uh, to that. Uh, that circle of, of friends. And I think that Behar's collaborators, you know, um, are um, exemplary as well in that way. It's just who, who, you, the people you can work with are the people you can trust, and they don't have to be the people you can sleep with, um, but they have to be people who are okay with the people who you sleep with. You know what I mean? I don't want to sound like Castex with the, uh, you know, cas um, uh, contact, des cas contact, ne sont pas des cas contact. But, um, but, but, but it has to be okay. It has to be very okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I never thought you would mention Castex. <laughs> yeah, I kind of miss him now. <laughs> Well, not that much. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if uh, your title had something to do with eccentric abstraction. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and in, like, how do you relate? By or? Lucy Lepard. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, absolutely. Because I, I just think that uh, the critic um, and author Lucy Lepard, feminist, uh, uh, reframed um, minimalism, basically, in, 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 a, in a way that accounted for um, 
a, a, a larger conversation that included people like Eva Hesse, um, who were not working in hard edges and shiny metal materials, and, and, and yet we're, we're working with, with form in, in series and um, um, that used space uh, it, it, as part of um, the, the visual dynamic. Um, and I just thought that was so brilliant, such a brilliant move. I totally stole that. Yeah, yeah. I, t I, I completely, to totally stole that from Lucy Lepard. But what's interesting is that you actually, of course, take a new glance and new approach to the 20s instead of looking as Lucy Lepard to her, her contemporaries. So it's a. Uh, well, one of the things I found um, um, after uh, uh, I started kind of appropriating eccentric um, in 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 my um, in my work was this publication from the nineteen early nineteen thirties that that was um, that was essentially about the kind of people we're not used to talking about, or it, it was it was. And, it, and, and the, the author of this little catalog of people that, it was an interesting uh, 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 project uh, by an art critic who was also a curator who um, uh, wanted to grapple with the um, people like, uh, uh, who, who, weren't, who were featured in shows at MoMA, in the early days, but um, were no longer resonated at all. Um, people whose work, you know, um, just didn't quite fit uh, the storyline as it evolved um, about 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 art and contemporary um, practice. And w one of the words that he used was um, these eccentrics, and and so so I felt like the. Um, that there, there's been some kind of subliminal mm. um, uh, narrative, you know, um, over over time about eccentricity that that just kind of cropped up for me now um, in this way. But that that that's just a reminder. That's just a reminder to look kind of beyond um, our uh, our usual. Uh, areas of, of focus and, and, and try not to edit out mm -mm. things that just don't quite fit with, you know, that we're not comfortable with the way, you know, well, what is this, you know, that we can't <laughs> explain in the, terms, in the terms that we have learned um, to, to explanatory terms that we've learned, that's all. And another term is degenerate which was used also to kind of qualify a s certain modernity at one point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. yeah, and then that, that remains, um, I think, you know, that could be rehabilitated like queer, um, but it remains kind of... Of course. You know, yeah. <laughs> challenging yes, <laughs> to, sure. to put into play, yeah. but yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I have a question for you both. I wanted to know, um, because Berard had a second family, Stein had a second family, I wanted to know if you have, you had a second family too. Oh. And, <laughs> and if it, it's influenced your work or your artistic work or your written work. Oh, that's so sweet. I love that you asked that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, one of the great, great pleasures of getting older has been seeing um, people who've made an impact on me and who at one time uh, and many times over have uh, uh, appeared in 
um, my footnotes um, and been repeatedly uh, cited by, by uh, me as I think through um, whatever it is I'm grappling with and, and to a actually meet the people who are in my footnotes um, and have conversations with them and, and develop um, real relationships um, in time and space uh, uh, has been just um, kind of in, in a way like um, mapping out, you know, uh, that, or tracing that family tree. Yes, indeed. I mean, kindred, kindred spirits, that's, you know, sort of where I, the high I was coming off of after um, Celia's walkthrough of the exhibition and after being, um, spending the day with Nick and feeling, you know, very much at the bosom of a second family um, here today. And, and, and yes, I think that, that, you know, these identifications that we make, it doesn't really matter that they're, if they're never reciprocated um, or acknowledged, um, but, but it's really thrilling when they are. Uh, and and um, I definitely feel like the support that comes from um, sharing values and sharing ideas with people we don't know um, um, and may never know is, is, is uh, a source of, of incredible strength and replenishment. Um, but but I I'm beholding to a lot of people that I that I that I do that I do know and have known um, for a long time. One of them you saw in one of my slides, um, Wanda Korn, uh, American art historian, who uh, I is an, intuitively would never have thought that um, we would have that much to say to each other, and um, she's. Uh, she was my dissertation advisor, so that that's a kind of a fraught beginning of a relationship. Um, and she said stuff to me all all along when I was kind of trying to develop this peculiar skill set. Uh, uh, you know, basically, um, but you can't write a whole dissertation about that. You know, the, so this, it was very important for me to have somebody telling me what I couldn't do. And she did it very well for a very long time. And then she kind of threw in the towel and just, you know, got, she said, okay, well, you do that and I'll do this and we'll get together, you know, and do something. And it'll be really different for both of us. And so that, that, that's an example. Um, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's my second family is probably more important to me than my first family, actually. Um, so that question is meaningful to me. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to say also that when you, when I heard you asking the question, I thought, well, that's that's my family, you know. That yeah. my second family is my family, mm -hmm. um, and from a young age, probably, it, you know, just. I, I, I kind of knew that, and um, um, when I could, I met someone that I could have, um, or I instantly knew, oh, this conversation is possible. Um, that that kind of, you know, it's such a life-changing um, relationship to have, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, uh, I mean, even during confinement, I, I realized I started maybe going in another direction where I. You know, couldn't see people, but these relationships developed over letters and so on um, that have been really inspiring and uh, you know ongoing. Um, uh, but I, yeah, I think it's totally essential to you know. It's it's I can't um, imagine doing anything without <laughs> having uh, um, this kind of evolving. Uh, second family um, and these these relationships that seem to come out of nowhere like you know uh, working with you Celia and can th that you know I could never have imagined that it would be a continuity like this and always um, you know completely surprising and overwhelming and <laughs> um, 
so yeah, I'm, I'm very, um, very grateful for that. <laughs> yeah. No. And I mean, like I said today, when <laughs> we were talking, when I first um, read Tears's book, it was really this thing like, oh, I've been, I've been looking for this. You know, mm. who is this person? <laughs> mm, yeah. It's yeah. funny, we were introduced um, by somebody, a second family yeah. member, um, who, who thought we already, you know, we, we are, we're related, we must know each other. So, and, and, and it's like, well, you have to get in touch with him. Yeah. I never do that. I never do that kind of cold thing. Well, this, you know, so-and-so says, I, I have to introduce myself to you. <laughs> and I happen to be in New York for two minutes, and could we get together right now? You know, yeah. never do that. I've never done that before, and I'll never do it again. Thank goodness it, it was just, you know, it was you. I'm so glad you did. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> Alors, merci beaucoup. Non, c'est moi qui Et si vous en avez d'autres plus informés, n'hésitez pas, vous aurez encore quelques minutes le temps qu'on on, on range tout ça. So we are family now. Yes. <coughs> merci encore, merci d'être venu. Bonne soirée.